All right. So we'll get some more practice in lab today with, with these formulas and molecular weights and get some practice with that. Um, for now, we're gonna go in lab, we're gonna go a little bit more into theory and how we can, can represent these molecules. Um, because you know the covalent compounds, I kind of presented the nomenclature for, for covalent compounds is okay, naming them is the easiest because you just use those prefixes, right? Just explicitly say how much of everything you have. So that the naming them was the easiest, but understanding what's what they actually look like and what the structures are and why some of them are stable and some aren't is a little trickier. Um, and one of the main tools we use to do that is what's called a Lewis dot structure. And so these Lewis dot structures are basically a way to represent um, how to make these electrons sort of all balance out. So the same way that for ionic compounds, we want all the charges to always add up to zero. We still want something similar for, for covalent compounds, but because we're not dealing with actual ions that have positive and negative charges, it's a little bit harder than just making the charges add up to zero. What we need to do instead is we need to make sure that we arrange the electrons so that everything has a full valence. That's our, kind of our primary um, motivation for, for forming compounds and, and molecules in general is that things are more stable when you have, when everything has a full valence. So with that in mind, the Lewis dot structure is just our best way to represent that. Um, and we, we do that in a way where we say, okay, every dot in these structures represents an electron, but sometimes it's more convenient to draw them as these um, bonds and every bond represents two electrons. It's a pair of electrons. Um, it turns out having unpaired electrons is exceptionally unstable, even more stable than having a charge or having an incomplete valence. And so the first thing that usually happens is you wind up with, with these electrons pairing up so that you have no unpaired electrons. Um, and so it's a lot of times it's more convenient to draw these, these um, bonds to represent that. Right, and so the, the process for drawing these is, is I won't say it's straightforward because it can be kind of tricky, um, but it has some pretty defined steps and sort of strategies. Generally speaking, and, and we will refine these, the further you go in chemistry, the better we get at drawing these because we kind of add some more clarification steps, the more you understand some of the other concepts. Um, for now, our process is gonna be place the atom with the most bonds in the center. And then place the remaining atoms around it. And you count your total number of valence electrons and you divide them up so that everything has a full valence. So you start by connecting cent center atom. So, and, and don't worry, I'll leave this up here while we go through some examples. Um, you start by connecting the central atom to each surrounding atom with a bond. And then you add all the remaining electrons to fill each atom's valence. All right, so if we wanted to look at something like water, how do we know what's going to make the most bonds out of H2O? How many electrons does hydrogen need to become, to have a full valence? Hydrogen's tricky because it could take, it seem, it's in column one on the periodic table, right? But it's in the, it's in row one of the periodic table as well. So if we're looking at these in terms of the electrons, to fill up the first energy level, you only need a total of two electrons, right? So hydrogen only needs to gain one electron to be stable. So in other words, it can make at most one bond 
it only needs to gain one electron to fill its, its ener first energy level. Oxygen, on the other hand, you can go back here. Oxygen is over here in column 16. It needs to gain two electrons to have the same number of electrons as neon, right? So oxygen has a total of two vacancies in its valence shell. It has two open spots. So it can make up to two bonds. So that tells us right there that oxygen has to be in the middle. If we start by putting oxygen in the middle and then we just put two hydrogens on either side of it, we know that they have to be attached to it. Otherwise they wouldn't be part of the molecule. So we can just start by saying, okay, well, I'm gonna put my oxygen in the middle and put my hydrogens on either side of it. And then you count your total number of valence electrons. And so that's going to be every all the valence electrons that everything brings to the table. Each hydrogen brings one valence electron to the table. Oxygen brings six electrons to the table. So if you're showing your work for this, you could write it as something like, okay, well, I've got one oxygen that brings six electrons, and there's two hydrogens that each bring one electron. Gives us a total of eight valence electrons. Right, so whatever that covalent compound is we're dealing with, we can still do this. We just look at the periodic table. This is why we, we learned to count valence electrons in the first place. One is so we can predict charge on the ions, but the other one is so that we can figure out how many valence electrons we have to work with. So once we do this, this is sort of two things that are happening and, and really setting up your atoms like this and counting your valence electrons, doesn't matter what order you do it in. The trick is now we have to put them together. We need to arrange all eight of these electrons so that everything has a full valence. Which in this case isn't too bad. You can start by drawing the bonds between the oxygen and the hydrogen. And you can draw them as these, <coughs> as a pair of electrons um, in between, or you can draw it just by drawing a line in between the middle atom and the outside atoms. And then once we do that, this here are the bonds that we know have to be there. These bonds have to be there or else we wouldn't have H2O, right? It, it's only H2O because there are two hydrogens attached to an oxygen. So we know that those have to be attached. Now what we want to do is we're going to take the electrons that we have left so we started with eight valence electrons. Now we have four electrons left. And we need to arrange them so that everything has a full valence. How many electrons are around this hydrogen right now? Two. And how many electrons does a hydrogen need to have a full valence? A total of two. So this hydrogen is satisfied. It's got a full valence, it's stable. Same for this hydrogen, right? They're identical. How many electrons are around the oxygen right now? Only four, the way it's drawn. When I say right now, I mean the way it's currently drawn. The oxygen has four electrons around it. How many total valence electrons does the oxygen need? Eight. Lucky us, we've got four electrons left. So where are we gonna put those other four electrons? Yeah, around the oxygen. And this is sort of a, a habit that, I'm, that I get into to show that these pairs of electrons are there because it can be really easy to lose a couple of small dots. I like to draw basically like a, a little balloon around them to show that those that pair of electrons is there so that you don't forget that they're there when it comes to figuring out what these shapes look like. So now we've used eight electrons. We started with eight electrons. And if we did everything right, everything should have a full valence. Our hydrogens are both so good. Oxygen satisfies the octet rule, right? So that's, those are our criteria for determining if we drew the right Lewis dot structure. Is 
were you able to use the right number of electrons, it has to be eight electrons. Rule number one is you can't make matter up out of nothing, right? So if you only have eight valence electrons to work with, you have to use eight valence electrons. The second rule is fill all the valences, right? So as long as you can say yes to those two things, I use the right number of electrons and all the valences are filled, that's a valid Lewis dot structure. So let's do, let's do another practice. Let's look at potassium trichloride. So potassium trichloride formula for which BCL3. Sorry, phosphorus trichloride. Uh, <laughs> I've never done that before. First time for everything. Phosphorus trichloride. Potassium trichloride wouldn't make any sense at all, right? Which is why you guys all started murmuring to yourselves as soon as I said that. Good job. So what's the atom that's gonna have the, the most vacancies out of these? Phosphorus, that one that's not potassium. Yeah, phosphorus is in the is in column 15 on the periodic table. So that means it's going to need to gain three electrons. It has three vacancies in its valence shell. And then that means we know that the chlorines have to be sort of arranged around it somehow. So there's a couple of sort of generalization rules that you can use that are usually correct, but not always. For instance, the atom that you have one of is usually in the middle, but not always. In fact, it turns out the atom being the atom with the most vacancies means it's usually in the middle, but not always. There are exceptions to those rules. So we'll go through it this way first, and then I'll teach you the version that has no exceptions. How many valence electrons do we have to work with? So those are how, that's how many each one needs to gain. How many electrons does each one have? So we have three chlorines and each chlorine brings seven valence electrons. because chlorine is in column 17. Phosphorus, we have one phosphorus and the phosphorus brings five valence electrons. So that gives us a total of 24 electrons. Four, four. Three times seven is 21, isn't it? Yep. Oh yeah. And I'm just off my game today. <laughs> <laughs> there are, the charges are not three and one. We have three chlorines. Remember, charges are written up into the right, but up into the right, not down. So PCL3 means you have three chlorines, each of which brings seven electrons. Phosphorus is in column 15, which means it has five valence electrons, and there's only one of it one of them. When phosphorus is stable, it's gained three. When it's, in, when it's a negative ion, it's gained three electrons. That's probably what you're thinking of. So phosphide is a negative three and chloride is a negative one. We don't have either of those though, because this is a covalent compound, not a, an ionic compound. So we're not looking at the charges, we're looking at it when it's on the periodic table, when it's neutral. 
that's when we're counting up these valence electrons. So if we have 26 electrons total to work with, what's the first thing I can do to start assigning those electrons? What do, what do we know has to be there? It's PCL3, right? So what do we know about the chlorines and the phosphorus? They have to be attached, don't they? So right off the bat, we can do that. We can write a pair of electrons in between the phosphorus and each of the three chlorines because they all have to be attached, right? So how many electrons did we just use? Six, each bond is a pair of electrons. So that means we have 20 electrons left. So we have to distribute those 20 electrons in such a way that everything has a full valence, Sam? Could we write something dots, just put the bond line? Yeah. Oh, sorry. So if it's not if it's not in between two atoms, no, you have to write it as a, as a pair of dots. So the way that I like to approach assigning the rest of these is always to work from the outside in, because there are a couple of things that wind up happening to make that work. But that, that you want to be systematic about it. So either start by making the central atom happy and then distribute what you have left to the outside. But since what you have around the outside is a lot of the time is symmetrical anyway, you can, if you make everything along the outside happy first, you'll wind up seeing where, the, where to put the last couple of electrons a lot easier. So how many electrons does each chlorine still need? An additional six, it had, each chlorine has a pair of electrons. So now we need an extra six. So we just do this for each chlorine. We just use the bulk of our electrons, right? And that makes things a lot easier to see what else needs to happen. We just use another six times three. So 18 electrons, we have two electrons left. Each chlorine is stable. So what's the last thing we need to do? We still have one atom that's missing a pair of electrons to have a full valence. And we have a pair of electrons left. So by Starting at the outside, working our way in, it made it really obvious where to put those last pair of electrons. Sometimes it can be a little bit tricky if you try to, if you start at the middle and work your way out, it can be hard to see where to put the extra electrons. And the, your, the way you can check your answer for these is always, does everything have a full valence? Actually, I should switch the order. Did I use the total number of electrons that I needed to? If you count up all the electrons that I just drew, are there 26 of them? And there should be. And does everything have a full valence? Each chlorine has eight electrons. Phosphorus has eight electrons. So everything's stable. Which means we did a good job. So what do we do when we have more than when we, it gets tricky to decide what goes in the middle or how to fill up these electrons. Um, so for instance, I guess the, the number one way to look at it is, let's see, I know I've said this phrase already in here a few times, um, whatever's closest to fluorine, use that as our, determining what we write second in the formula a lot of the time, right? That's the context that we talked about. Just look at whatever's closest to fluorine and that goes second in your formula, right? It really, it's, it's related to a, a property called electronegativity. And electronegativity 
is basically the same as it's the opposite of ionization energy. And that's whatever is most electronegative is best at pulling the electrons towards itself. So the same, the same logic for why we write whatever's closest to fluorine gets written second in our covalent formulas. It also means whatever's closest to fluorine is never going to be the central atom. You don't put the central atom or whatever's closest to fluorine will not be the central atom because whatever the central atom is has to share more. And so whatever's best at pulling electrons towards itself is really bad at sharing. All right, so for, for PCL3, there's phosphorus and then there's fluorine. Fluorine is closer to fluorine, so fluorine won't go in the middle. If we had something like um, N2O, dinitrogen monoxide, what's closest to fluorine out of nitrogen and oxygen? Oxygen's closer to fluorine, so oxygen can't go in the middle. Even though you only have one of them, it can't be the central atom. Right, so this is the version of this rule that never doesn't have any exceptions. Whatever's closest to fluorine is, will never be the central atom. That, he, that still made me a little nervous to say that. Well, just to clarify, when you're saying closest, you're meaning literally just position wise in the periodic table. The periodic table is structured the way it is based on the electronic orbitals, right? Which means that those periodic trends that we learned in terms of size and ionization energy and now electronegativity are all related to those orbitals as well. So yeah, physically closest on the periodic table means most similar in terms of the orbitals. So which is closer, oxygen or fluorine? Oxygen, because oxygen is closer to having the same electron structure because they both have the vacancies in the second energy level. Um, and if you check your periodic table printout, it actually has a list of electronegativities. And I had to close out of, let me do it from here. on this one. Dang, I want this version then. So the version of the periodic table that I've been printing out for everybody has, no, where are those? Uh, I had a list of the electron, or the uh, electronegativities. Not that one. I'm going to put it in the in the documents that you guys have access to. Let's see. Practice test. That's what that'll do it. This version. See these electronegativity values in the top? Higher the electronegativity means less likely to share. So higher electronegativity means it won't be in the middle. So fluorine is the highest electronegativity, all right around four. And these are weird units called degrees Pauling. Um, after Linus Pauling, who invented this scale, um, oxygen is the second most electronegative, and then chlorine. So when you're comparing chlorine and oxygen, oxygen wins out, and then chlorine is the third most electronegative, and then nitrogen. So if you're ever unsure, come back here, 
can double check here because this is the, the actual numbers as opposed to just graphically what's physically closest on the periodic table. So what would your elect our electron dot structure look like for N2O, dinitrogen monoxide? How many valence electrons do we have to work with? 16, so six from the oxygen and each nitrogen brings five. So if we have 16 electrons to work with and then oxygen can't be in the middle. So that means the nitrogen has to be in the middle. We have an, an asymmetric molecule here, which is weird. But if we can't put oxygen in the middle because nitrogen is less electronegative, then so be it. We just have an asymmetric molecule. And with our 16 electrons, what's the first thing we want to do? Connect the central atom to the other two. So how many electrons do we have left? 12 electrons left. And this is another case where it'll become obvious why we start at the outside and work our way in. One, the atom in the middle is less in electronegativity, right? So it's the best at sharing. It's the weakest, basically. Think of all the atoms as being bullies. You know, this is not don't have any sort of like social cues or society developing where they're giving up their electrons for the greater good. That's not how this works, right? Whatever has the ability to keep the electrons for itself does. Whatever's stuck in the middle has to share more than it wants to. So since the, the stronger electro, or the atoms are always gonna be at the outside because they're less electronegative, start by filling up the outside first. How many electrons does, each of the outside atoms still need. Each one still needs another six, right? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. And now we have no electrons left. So now what do we do? Our central atom still needs four more, right? So the most important thing is that we use the right number of electrons. We did that. We can't just add more electrons because we can't make matter out of nothing. We know based on the charge, it only had 16 electrons to work with. So what do we have to do? And we got to make some of these ones, some of these outside atoms share more than they want to. And so we do that by making double bonds or triple bonds. Basically, now that we have all of our electrons in the picture here, we can rearrange them by saying, OK, I'm going to erase one of these pairs and turn it into an extra bond. So I just made this nitrogen closer to being stable at the expense of the outside nitrogen, right? Well, now we still need one more pair here, don't we? So we do the same thing over on the oxygen side and say, okay, well, I'm gonna make that outside oxygen share more than it wants to as well. We still only have a total of 16 electrons. But by making those extra bonds, everything has a full valence now. And so the oxygen and the outside nitrogen, they don't want to share more than a single pair of electrons, but we sometimes they have to in order to make the valences fill. That's more important than the fact that they don't want to share. And so, That's the 
the general gist of the Lewis dot structures, it's always going to be use the right number of electrons, fill all the valences. If you've done that, you at least have an acceptable Lewis dot structure, even if sometimes there are better versions. And double and sometimes triple bonds are what form when you don't have enough electrons to fill all the octets, to fill all the valences the normal way. So CO2 is another good example. So practice drawing Lewis dot structure for carbon dioxide. I'll give you a couple, a couple seconds head start and then I'll start working through it. So for CO2, we also wind up with 16 electrons. Four from the single carbon, and then each oxygen brings six valence electrons for a total of 16 valence electrons. We know carbon has to go in the middle because carbon is less electronegative than oxygen. So it's worse at pulling electrons towards itself. So we can start by drawing bonds between the carbon and the two oxygens. So now we have 12 electrons left. And where should we start assigning those 12? Yeah. The outer ring, work, work our way in, right? Oxygen's the bigger bully, so it gets first dibs. We're down to no electrons left, but the carbon still has needs two more pairs, right? So once we've assigned all of our electrons, we don't have anything to work with, we can't just, and this is the number one thing that people struggle with. When there's, when you're missing electrons, you can't just add them anymore, right? We counted up these valence electrons by looking at the periodic table and looking at the charge on the molecule. So we can't just throw two more pairs of electrons on there. We don't have two more pairs to give. So we have to make these oxygens share more than they want to. So when you erase a pair of electrons, you can add another bond. We do that from both sides. We get a Lewis dot structure that still has 16 valence electrons and also has everything in a full valence. I, that's the key, and that takes a little practice to get to see how that works sometimes. Does it matter which electron is away? I'm glad you asked that. 
Um, because we're going to start talking about the shape of these molecules in, in when we get back from break. And we know that the number of electrons they have is one of the key components to what shape they take. It all just comes down to geometry and knowing how many things are taking up space around this atom. So it doesn't matter which pair we, we erase and redraw because the Lewis dot structure isn't the whole story because really these things don't stay at 90 degrees to each other. They rearrange so that they can spread out as much as possible because all these electrons are going to push away the other electrons as much as they can. So no, it doesn't matter which ones we, we draw specifically. We'll do one more example that involves some triple bonds, another way of doing double and triple bonds. Um, if we look at, we'll do hydrogen cyanide. So HCN, what's going to go in the middle? Hydrogen, I guess, sorry, let's just do cyanide first and then we'll do hydrogen cyanide. So just CN with a minus charge. If there are only two atoms, is there a middle? Not really. We know we have a, a carbon and we know we have a nitrogen. And how many valence electrons do we have to work with? We have four electrons from the carbon, five electrons from the nitrogen. What does that negative sign tell us? we get one extra electron to play with, right? There has to be one extra electron. That's why it's a polyatomic ion. It's why polyatomic ions exist is because they're covalent compounds that either need extra electrons or have too many electrons to be stable. So that negative one charge means we have one extra electron to work with. So we have a total of 10 electrons we can rearrange here now. We know that two of them have to be used to connect this, the carbon to the nitrogen. So we have eight electrons left. Where should we start assigning them? Which of them, those two atoms is stronger? The nitrogen. And the nitrogen needs how many of those eight? Another six, right? So now nitrogen satisfied. We have two and we have two electrons left. So they go to the carbon. Are we done? What do we need to do? Why aren't we done? It's a better question. Carbon doesn't have a full valence, therefore it's not stable. So we have to erase some electrons from the nitrogen. How many more pairs does the carbon need? Two more pairs. So just in the interest of just picking some at random, I just, I erase two of the pairs and turn them into bonds. Did I still use a total of 10 electrons? Yeah. Does everything have a full valence now? Yeah. So cyanide and all of the all of the polyatomic ions are, are also fair game for doing these Lewis dot structures. They still all follow the same rules 
they just have slightly different numbers of electrons to work with. And that's why they have a charge. They either have extra electrons or not enough electrons, but they still follow our same rules of put the le least electronegative element in the middle and then surround it with all the others and, and fill all the valences. So what is hydrogen cyanide going to look like? What's different about hydrogen cyanide? We have a hydrogen, right? Does it change our total number of starting electrons? So I'm gonna erase this and start from a blank page again so I can write. If it's HCN, if we're assuming that all of those are neutral and none of, none of it's charged, then we still wind up counting 10 electrons to work with, don't we? So we still have 10 electrons. It's just that, that instead of that extra charge being the, that one electron by itself, the hydrogen, we can think of the hydrogen as bringing that one electron, right? So five electrons from the nitrogen, four from the carbon, and one from the hydrogen. And if we just looked at electro electronegativity, we would say put the hydrogen in the middle. But can we do that? Why not? Hydrogen only can take one extra electron, right? It only needs one electron to fill its valence, which means by definition, hydrogen can never be a central atom. Because how do you make a central atom with something that can only make one bond? You can't. So our electronegativity argument has to be kind of amended a little bit. It has to be the least electronegative besides hydrogen, because hydrogen can't be in the middle. Now, when we add our first set of bonds, we use two pairs, so we have six electrons left, right? And where do they go? The outermost ones, which of the outer atoms? Hydrogen can't take any more atoms or any more electrons. So the six that we have left, six electrons that we have left have to go to the nitrogen. Are we done? No. Just like before, right? Nitri or the carbon still needs two more pairs, right? So, so it's still a carbon nitrogen triple bond like we did for just the cyanide atom. It looks really similar to what we had for the cyanide atom, right? We just stuck that extra H plus where, the, where there was a lone pair attached to the carbon before. Did we fill everything's valence? Do we use the right number of electrons? Yeah. And just to compare it, cyanide when it was by itself, when it was just cyanide ion looked like this. So really not all that different is one of the reasons why the acids get their own style of naming, why they behave differently than ionic or covalent, because they're kind of covalent. We can draw a Lewis dot structure like they're covalent, but their dot structure just changes a little bit if you pull one of those H pluses off. It doesn't really change by that much, which means it's pretty easy to pull those H pluses off which is what makes it an acid, is the fact that it has this structure where you can easily lose an H plus without any of the rest of that, the uh, 
electron structure changing. All right, let's take a break. It's 10 minutes, let's come back at five after, and we'll talk about what this means in terms of molecular shape. Um, it, so we'll, we'll talk about why it does not for Lewis dot structures and we'll talk about why when we talk about the, the geometries. Hey Dan, I'll take that, thank you. Those lines equal to, so is it like this? How would you write these? Probably more like, like this. Oh, okay. Because each of these pairs is a bond. Okay. Thank you. Let me see if we can find the next one. Thank you. I don't think there's one up oh, there. There's one here. Let's see if it has any straight lines on it. And probably. Nope. No. Okay. That's okay. fine. Just fold over the corner. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Okay, feel better. Thank <laughs> you. 
No, really, you want the day after your birthday off. Can we get that? So Matt, the real pro tip is to never let anybody know when your birthday is. So then when you call it sick on your birthday, they don't know enough to second guess you. So that's great and all, but my schedule fly that takes care of the schedule always posts whoever's birthday is at the very top. So it's like, you, you can't get away from it. Misinformation. <laughs> you know, propaganda it's campaign, different. yeah. <laughs> All right, so here are a few, um, a few solutions for some other practice for these Lewis thought structures. We'll go over a couple of the trickier ones. Um, for all, pretty much all of the non-metals, if it's a non-metal, the reason that dividing line between the metals and the non-metals is even there is because 
Remember this, that stair step line that shows up there? That shows up because everything that's to the right of that stair step line gets more stable when it gains electrons. So the, the definition of a non-metal means it's trying to pull electrons towards itself. And yet, if you, if you look at it and you notice that, that it basically that the reason it's that stair step line is because it's basically all of those are the atoms that are equidistant from chlorine, right? Again, the closer the chlorine, the better it is when electrons towards itself. Anything past that line will give up electrons rather than take electrons. So everything in the non-metals, that means will, they will form bonds with themselves. If you have that pure neutral substance, it doesn't exist as just a random atom by itself it'll naturally find another atom of the same type and, sh and share electrons so that you wind up getting these compounds like chlorine gas. Chlorine, when it's in its pure elemental state, is not just Cl. It's Cl2 because a bunch of chlorine atoms by themselves will spontaneously form covalent bonds because that's how you can fill everything's valence at the same time. So chlorine gas, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, all of those non-metals will form these, they're what are known as the uh, molecular elements, because when they're in their pure state, they're not just a single atom by themselves. And let's see if there's a way to separate these. I'll just do it. So the ones that I circled in red are always going to be found as these diatomic molecules. So that's easy to figure out the etymology there, right? So you've got polyatomic ions, diatomic molecules, two atom molecules, right? So all of these nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, all of column 17, basically, and hydrogen form these diatomic molecules when they're in their most stable state, when they're in their pure state. They're not all that stable necessarily. If I come back here and clear the annotations. Um, hydrogen and chlorine in particular are, are pretty dangerous. Hydrogen is, is explosively flammable when you put it with, when you let it mix with oxygen. Chlorine is poisonous. Oxygen is what makes things burn because oxygen is not all that stable on its own. Nitrogen is the most stable of the bunch because it has a triple bond holding the two atoms together. It's more strongly attached than any of the others. But the rest of these, these um, atomic or diatomic elements um, will react pretty readily to form other, to form other compounds. Um, and we can predict that by looking at this, how many bonds they have in between them. So bromine, iodine, fluorine, chlorine, those are all used for various antiseptic purposes because they're really good at killing anything living because they're so reactive. Matt? Okay. Chlorine too. Could you essentially turn all those outside of the plant for chlorine? Close. So Chlorine is the only one out of these diatomic molecules we've looked at so far that has a d orbital. Even if it doesn't have a, any electrons in it, it has a d orbital because it's in the third energy level, right? When you get into the third energy level, we already saw that with metals that that d orbital made it so it wasn't really the octet rule anymore, right? Turns out that any any non-metals in the third row or below aren't limited to the octet rule. They have to have at least eight valence electrons, but they can have more, which is how you get molecules like 
per per chlorine. ClO4 with a minus one charge. We can draw a Lewis dot structure for that. But it turns out the chlorine's got to have more than eight electrons around it in order to do that. So chlorine can form more um, more bonds than just one bond. It's most commonly when it's in its most stable state, chlorine will only have one bond. But you can force it to make more bonds than that if you put it with something that's more electronegative, like oxygen. Oxygen's more electronegative, so if you have a lot of oxygens around, the oxygens will basically force the chlorine to share more electrons than it wants to. Right, so this is one of the reasons why it's there are more than one stable ways to combine different ratios of, of non-metals. Because if you have something like like chlorine, for instance, um, if we looked at chlorate, I'm just going to do this one kind of a little bit quicker so we can look at this. If we look at the number of valence electrons for chlorate, chlorate is going to have seven from, from the chlorine. There's six electrons from each oxygen and there are four oxygens plus an extra one at the end from the charge, All right? So four times six is 24 plus seven is 31. So that gives us a total of 32 electrons to work with. If we draw the Lewis dot structure for this, we start by surrounding the chlorine with our oxygens. And remember the chlorine has to go in the middle because oxygen is more electronegative. We just use eight of our 32, right? Which means there's still 24 electrons left. And how many does each oxygen still need? Six. And how many oxygens do we have? What's six times four? So out of the 24 we have left, they all have to go to the oxygens. And now we're out of electrons, right? And everything has a full valence. So all of that was a really roundabout way to answer Matt's very simple question of can those lone pairs be turned into bonds? Answer is yes, under the right circumstances. This is not a very stable compound though, because the chlorine would rather have its own electrons rather than have to be sharing with the oxygen. So perchlorate is a very good, see that would be a very good oxidizing agent because it's going to try and steal electrons from something else so that the chlorine can be more stable and the oxygens can stay stable as well. And we'll get into more about what that means when we talk about reactions here in a little bit. All right, one last practice here. If we have multiple atoms that aren't the same thing, we already did this once with the hydrogen cyanide, right? But out of all of those, how do we choose what goes in the middle? It's the least electronegative that's not hydrogen. And again, it's what can make the most bonds is, is really the most uniform way of looking at it. And there are a couple of things that go into that. Um, and it can be more than just how many, what has the most vacancies. So in this case, it can't be the hydrogen that goes in the middle and the oxygen is the most electronegative. So it has to be the carbon that goes in the middle. Which means you're gonna have an oxygen here. You're gonna have some hydrogens. And out of habit, from teaching OCHEM, I put that down there. And we have a total of 12 electrons to work with, right? Four from the carbon, two from each, or one from each hydrogen gives us six. And then the oxygen brings another six. 
And we can start by doing that. I'm going to erase this at the top here so I have room to keep drawing. So I've used, of my 12 electrons, I've used six. So I have six electrons left. And where are they all going to go? Let's give it to the oxygen first. Everything good? What do we still need to do? Carbon's still missing a pair, right? But we're out of electrons. We can't just dump another pair on there. So we can't make the hydrogens share any more than they already are because they're already sharing all of their electrons. They have no more electrons to share. So it has to come from the oxygen. So we need to erase a pair and turn it into a double bond. All right, so it does take some practice to get to see the common themes and the common sort of arrangements. There are a lot of similarities between different molecules because they all follow the same rules of you have to use the same number of electrons and you want everything to fill its valence. And since everything is trying to get to a total of at least eight electrons to fill its valence, other than hydrogen, they wind up with a lot of really similar looking molecules when you, when you start drawing these out. All right, so why is this helpful? Well, one, because it's, it's nice to be able to explain why some things, why some polyatomic ions have a charge and why that charge is the way it is. In fact, if you wanted a a trick for remembering the charge on polyatomic ions. You, most of them involve oxygen, right? Pretty much all of them have an oxygen. And oxygen has an even number of electrons when it's neutral, right? If you remember that all of these, all of these um, Lewis dot structures have to deal in pairs of electrons to be stable. That means if the atom that's not oxygen has an odd number of electrons, the charge has to be odd. Because an odd number of electrons on the central atom plus an odd number of electrons in the charge adds to what sort of charge? An even number of electrons. So nitrogen being in column 15, means that the charge on nitrate and nitrite has to be an odd charge. Sulfur being in column 16 means it has to have an even charge. Phosphorus being in column 15 means it has to be an odd charge. And those are your three big ones right there, right? But it also applies to carbonate. It also applies to the chlorates and the bromates. Bromates aren't even on your list, I don't think, right? Just chlorates. But that's a good way to remember. At the very least, if you're, I can't remember if sulfate is minus two or minus three. There you go. It has to be minus two because it's got an even number of electrons on the sulfur. So that right there, that makes it kind of worthwhile to have these Lewis dot structures right, right there to make the polyatomic ions make more sense. But the other thing that's really helpful is we can actually predict what the shape of the molecule is if we remember a few things, if we use these Lewis dot structures. And number one thing to remember is that almost all of the volume is electrons. Remember our analogy for you know, a baseball at pitcher's mound of, of Oracle Park? The baseball is the nucleus. The rest of the stadium is is the volume of that's all electrons. And what do we know about electrons interacting with other electrons? What, what do they do? I'm not looking for anything really profound. What's the charge on every electron? Yeah, they repel each other. They push each other away, right? 
if all of our electrons are negatively charged and all negative charges are going to push away all other negative charges, this is a, what's called a Feynman diagram. It's basically showing that if you have two electrons moving towards each other, when they get close enough, they push off of each other and then they move in the opposite directions again. Richard Feynman won a Nobel Prize for figuring out a good way he could show electrons pushing away other electrons. He got a Nobel Prize for, for defining how to draw that diagram there. Is that the it's called, it's, um, it's the electromagnetic force repelling them. And so it is a wave and since light, and you can actually measure the light of electrons pushing away other electrons. So I guess it was a little bit more in depth than just draw that structure and win a Nobel Prize, but not that much. If all of these electrons are pushing away other electrons, if you have groups of electrons around a nucleus, they're gonna push each other away, but they can't push each other away indefinitely because they have to stay around that same nucleus to be in the same valence shell. So the minimum repulsion, the, the way that you can get those electrons as far away from each other as possible, we don't measure it in terms of a distance, we measure it in terms of an angle. So what's the furthest apart you could have two things that measured as an angle? What's the furthest apart you could get your two arms? 180 degrees, right? You wouldn't measure the distance between your two arms as a length, you would measure it as, a, as an angle. We do the same thing with these electron clouds, with these lone pairs and these bonds. We say, okay, whatever is attached to this central atom is going to arrange itself so it's as far apart as possible. And that means we can predict what the geometry of these molecules look like. So for something like boron trifluoride, the Lewis dot structure, we're used to thinking on paper in 90 degree increments, right? That's just the way our brains work. It's the way we're used to thinking. So you might draw a Lewis dot structure that has everything being 90 degrees to each other, but that's not the way the molecule actually behaves. If I go back to that last molecule we just did, that CO, CH2O, we drew them, we drew everything like this, right? That's just out of convenience because we're used to thinking in 90 degree angles. What actually happens though, is that these bonds spread out so that they can be as far away from each other as possible. Because it's not like these electrons or these orbitals are stuck in one place. It's not like there's, there is a, you know, a hole where you have to screw in electron A and electron B and those two holes have to be 90 degrees to each other. They're just trying to physically be around the nucleus in this sort of weird cloud-like shape. So they can push around wherever they need to be. So that means we can predict the shape of the molecules if we have the Lewis dot structure. And so this idea is called valence shell electron pair repulsion, which is a mouthful, but describes a really obvious concept now that we've talked about it is just electrons push away other electrons. And it's just abbreviated as VSEPR. Even though it's V-S-E-P-R, they still say VSEPR because VSEPR sounds weird. So they still say VSEPR. VSEPR geometries are, is just the idea that we can use the 360 degrees that we have, the three dimensions that we have to work in, and predict the shape of these molecules. So if we only have, if we have something like this CH2O, which is formaldehyde, but I'm not gonna test you on the name there, but just so I can say formaldehyde. To describe this, the bond, the angle between the oxygen and the hydrogens is gonna be right around 120 degrees. because so that's gonna keep all of those groups of electrons about the same distance from each other. So the double bond really only counts as one group of electrons because both of, 
there's two pairs of electrons there, but they both are stuck in between the carbon and the oxygen. So they're only really taking up one spot. And so the shapes here are just predicted by looking at the geometry and saying, okay, how do I divvy this space up? Um, if you have more than three electron domains to work with, things get a little tricky to visualize, at least on paper, because we have three dimensions to work in, not just two. So if we only had two dimensions and we had four things taking up space, for instance, CH4, the electron dot structure looks like this. If we're saying, okay, we're, we're gonna arrange these so that these are as far apart as possible in two dimensions, how far apart would they be in angles? 90 degrees, right? We can get them further apart if we let this rearrange in three dimensions. We get something that looks like this shape. It's like a three-sided pyramid. It's not like a three-sided pyramid. The name of this geometry is a tetrahedron, which is a three-sided pyramid. Anybody plays uh, any sort of uh, complicated tabletop board games like Dungeons and Dragons, it's a D4, it's a four-sided die. Your center atom is in the middle of it, and then the four hydrogens arrange themselves around it so that they're all 109 and a half fish degrees from each other. It's not an exact number because you have 360 degrees in two dimensions to work in. And so it can arrange itself in a way that we don't have an exact way of, of representing that. You could keep extending the decimals out. I think it's 109.47 if you kept going, but it's further apart than 90 degrees. Right? And so these three dimensional shapes of these molecules is one of the things that chemistry does, gives us, that's really, really valuable in modern medicine is because understanding the shape of things like proteins and various sugars and other molecules in biochemistry allows us to do things like design medications that have a similar shape, but aren't exactly the same. So they interact with, the, with your proteins a little bit differently. So there are five basic shapes that everything is gonna be based on. And those, those five shapes are really the, the factor that determines which of those five shapes your molecule, your central atom is gonna look like it is how many electron domains do you have around that central atom? How many things are taking up space? All right, and so the first two are really straightforward. If you only have two things taking up space, they're going to be 180 degrees from each other. If you have three things taking up space, they're going to try to be 120 degrees from each other. Then we start getting into three-dimensional shapes. If you have four things taking up space, they form a tetrahedral geometry. If you have five things taking up space, they kind of look like a combination of a linear geometry and that 120 degree geometry was called a trigonal plane. Planar means flat, like it's all on the same plane. Trigonal means three. So a trigonal planar geometry combined with a linear geometry gives you this weird three-dimensional shape here that is a, um, it's the top is gonna be, or the, these ones around the middle are 120 degrees. And then you have sticking out of that trigonal planar geometry, you have a linear geometry sticking straight up and down. So if you can picture a triangle, think of an equilateral triangle. And then from the middle of that equilateral triangle, you have 
something sticking straight up and straight down. So if we draw, if we looked at this molecule from directly above, you'd have one more atom coming straight out towards the class and one behind the board, into the board away from us. And so if this is the flat three planar shape, then you also have a linear shape into the board and out of the board. And the, the more common way of drawing it is like this so that you can see everything. Um, and this might come as a shock, but chemists are not known for their artistic abilities. So we need a way, a standardized way for people to be able to draw these shapes on a flat piece of paper that conveys what the three-dimensional shape looks like. Um, so we basically just, we, we have a, a way of drawing bonds to show that they're either sticking out of the board or going into the board. And so the way that we draw that is if it's a bond that's drawn just like a line, that means it's in the plane of the board. It's flat. So I'm drawing the same molecule with the same orientation here. If it's coming out of the board, you draw it as this wedge, which if I color it in, and you use your imagination and you squint, it kind of looks like a flat bond coming out of towards you, right? It's getting bigger as it comes towards you. It's not perfect, but it at least is a way to show something similar to this. And everybody can just draw a wedge like this. It's just a triangle. You don't even have to color it in. To show something going into the board, we do the same thing. You make it get smaller though, and you make it dotted to show that it's behind the board. So those two are, are just the ways of saying, okay, I don't have a good way of drawing this by hand on a piece of paper, but I want to show that this chlorine is away from us into the board and this chlorine is coming out towards us. So why bother remembering this? Well, because these names are really complicated to remember, to memorize. I'm not going to make you memorize these names because these names get more complicated when you start filling in some of these atoms with lone pairs. As long as you can draw it accurately and use the wedges and dashes the right way, you don't have to remember that this shape is called a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. You can just draw it like this and you can get full credit as long as you draw it with the bonds approximately the right angles and you show things going into the board and out of the board the right way. You count how many things are taking up space around that phosphorus. Because whatever's taking up space is pushing away on everything else, right? So with the, the geometry is determined by how many objects you have around that center atom. So and we'll get into that in a second. We draw or uh, talk about the last shape, which is if you have six things taking up space, the furthest apart that they can actually arrange themselves in three dimensions is actually 90 degrees from each other. If you think of something being totally flat, and having these, so sulfur, four chlorines, each of the chlorines is 90 degrees from the other chlorines. And then you have one more sticking out towards you and one more going into the board. So these, this looks like X, Y, Z coordinates. If you've taken algebra that where you do things in three, where you plot things in three dimensions, X and Y are 90 degrees to each other, right? Z and then Z is coming straight out of the paper towards you. That's what this geometry is. We call that X, 
actually backwards. So that X and that Y and Z is up and down. Everything's 90 degrees from everything else. So in that, in polyhedral dice terms, that's a D8. It's a square with a point at the top and the point at the bottom. Or you can think of it as being a four-sided pyramid stacked on top of itself. Four-sided pyramid, right? Ish. If you think of another four-sided pyramid where the square sides are facing each other, that's what this octahedral shape is. Which I don't usually draw elongated like that. If you've ever played The Sims, isn't that the little symbol that, that spins above the Sims head? That's an octahedron. It's just stretched out. <laughs> all right. So now how do we decide which of these? Well, it all depends on how many things are forced to be around that center atom because these, these electrons are trying to be as far apart as possible, right? So all you have to do is draw your Lewis dot structure and figure out how many things are taking up space around that center atom. And it tells you which of these shapes we're looking at. So for instance, let's go back to the formaldehyde that we had a second ago. How many things are taking up space around that carbon? There are three things taking up space around that carbon, right? The oxygen's taking up space and the two hydrogens are taking up space. That tells us that this carbon in general has a trigonal planar geometry. It's gonna be, look something like this. So this is why the Lewis dot structure is we covered those first before we did this. You have to be able to get the Lewis dot structure to get to these shapes. You need to know how everything's arranged before you can say, okay, and therefore it means everything's got 120 degrees freedom. Let's see, what was one of the other ones? Um, all right, let's look at let's look at water. Water looked like that, right? Except I drew water. like this, and if you take a biology class, you may have heard water referred to as being bent. It's not a linear molecule. Because how many things are taking up space around that oxygen? There's two bonds. The lone pairs still take up space though. We can't see them directly because we can only measure things that have mass. We can only measure directly where the nuclei are. But we know that those things are still taking up space. They're still pushing away the other electrons. So there are four things taking up space around this water molecule, which means it's not linear. It's tetrahedral. The better way of drawing this would be to draw it like this. It's this shape, except that two of those H's are replaced by long pairs. You can't really see the lone pairs, but we know that they're there because despite the fact that water is H2O, there's only three atoms, it's not linear. It's bent, 
because those lone pairs still take up space. All right, and so the, the number of lone pairs, if these are our five basic shapes, we have a whole bunch of other varieties, other flavors of geometries that are basically one of these, but you replace one of the atoms with a lone pair. And if you replace an atom with a lone pair, it looks different because we can't see the lone pair. We can only see where the nuclei are. They're easiest to draw that way. So I typically draw them that way. You, I could just, so all four of those positions are identical to each other. So I could be just as correct if I switched, if I switched it, if I said oxygen, hydrogen up, hydrogen over here, that's about 109 degrees. Lone pair going into the board and a lone pair coming out of the board. That's just a little bit harder to visualize than it is, if, especially if we're using the balloon shape to represent those lone pairs. And again, this is one reason why drawing that balloon shape is helpful. Not only do you not forget the lone pairs there, I don't want you to forget that they take up space. Right? Try to picture if you had four regular birthday balloons and you tried to hold all four of them by the knot at the same time. They're going to push each other all away, right? they will actually naturally form a tetrahedral shape because that's how you can get as much space as possible between all of them at the same time. Now, if you picture two of them as being clear balloons that you can't see and two of them as being red balloons that you can see, you get something that looks like water. All right, so this, this graphic just has all of the different possible names. Again, this is why I'm, it's, it can be advantageous to get used to using those wedges and dashes. Because you don't need to remember all of these because this first column are the names of the basic geometries. And then all these other ones are, okay, if I start replacing things with a lone pair. So if I, if I have six electron domains, elect you know, six things taking up space. And one of them is a lone pair. You get something that looks like a square pyramid, a four-sided pyramid, right? Think of our octahedral shape. Well, if you can't see this thing at the bottom, it's just a square pyramid, right? So everything from the first, or this direction from the first column is just this basic shape, but you can't see part of it. And it gives it a different name. So octahedral would be if you can see all six things that are attached to that central atom. Square pyramids, you can't see one of them. A square planar is you can't see two of them. Because if I erase this corner at the bottom and if I erase this corner at the top, what's left is just a square. And if I erase three of them, you get a square, you get a T-shape. If you erase four of them, you just get a straight line. You get something that looks linear again. Right? But they all start from the same basic geometries these geometries. So this shows them a little bit more clear, but this uses that wedges and dashes to get used to it and has all of the possibilities. If you have something that's linear and you replace one of those things with a lone pair, what do you really have? So let's, let's look at compare CO2 to cyanide. So CO2 looks like this, our Lewis dot structure did. Two things taking up space around that carbon, right? 
if there's only two electron domains, it's got to be linear, right? 180 degrees is the furthest they can be from each other. Cyanide looked like this. Carbon still has two things taking up space, right? So it would still look linear, except if you can't see this in the end, it still looks linear, right? So replacing one of those things with a lone pair doesn't really do any, anything, which is why there's like it's all blank to the right there for two electron groups. The electron geometry is always going to be one of these five. And then basically the molecular geometry is, okay, well, what about if you can't see it? What if you pretend you can't see the lone pairs? And so then it can be one of these others. Or you just learn how to draw it with the wedges and the dashes and you don't need to memorize the names. All right. So we already did, I don't know why this is here. Um, it's way out of line, out of space there. All right, we will go ahead and end a few minutes early because based on where we got, I'm gonna have to change what the lab is today. So if you have lab today, come to lab if you can. This is actually, this is good news for a lot of people because everybody had weird scheduling things this week. We're gonna switch to another lab that can be done all on paper. You just need a computer. And it's gonna have you play around with these geometries on your computer. Um, or come to lab and we can use the lab, the uh, laptops there and also the, the uh, chemical models that we have to do the same thing, All right? So check online, watch for that change in the assignment.